Welcome um, from Washington. Uh, and I'm just going to give a brief introduction because I want you to feel that uh, you can have access uh, to our guest speaker um, in the way that we were doing it in the first session as well. And uh, we talked yesterday, and you're prepared to take questions on anything. And uh, Giorgio made clear that he expects that uh, there should be some questions on Indonesia as well. I don't know if you were here when he said that. I leave it to you, though, to help set the agenda. Uh, but let me invite you to give your remarks. So send me those questions as you hear our guest speaker speaking. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick, at least for reminding me that the question is going to be about anything. So it's really great, great pleasure to be with you here in, at the Singapore Summit. Um, as you all know, this forum has become a prime event for discussing development in Asia and beyond. Singapore is an obvious place for this forum, a country at the very heart of Asia, although Tommy mentioned that should be careful on saying that, especially in front of Indonesian and strongly linked to the region through trade, finance, and people. At the World Bank, we are pleased to be a partner of Singapore with a growing office that focuses on infrastructure and urban development. Many have predicted that the 21st century will be the ASEAN century. ASEAN economies have done well in the past decade, first led by Japan, then by the ASEAN Tigers, and more recently by China and India. With few exceptions, ASEAN economies have rebounded from the ASEAN financial crisis back in 1990s and the recent global financial crisis, often faster and stronger than expected. If measured in comparable prices, China will soon overtake the U.S. as the largest economy, and by 2050, it will constitute a quarter of the world economy. India will compete with the U.S. for second place, and Indonesia will be about to overtake Japan. This success inspires others. In fact, Ngozi mentioned that we should look in the Africa. I just visited Tanzania and Ethiopia, the two countries with high poverty still, but also with a very high growth rate in the last decade, and they are not driven by commodity, exactly what Ngozi mentioned. Both countries are looking toward Asia to learn from its lessons and copy the region's success. This illustrates how dynamic this region is. But despite this prospect, Asia faces challenges, and there is no reason for complacency. History is not destiny, and the question is, are they ready to face new hurdles? I believe more can be done. I believe if emerging economies in Asia manage a complex and intertwined set of challenges, success lies ahead. Today, I want to highlight three areas in which ASEAN economies can influence their future. First, ASEAN needs to balance its growth strategy by looking inward, not just outward mentioned by previous speaker in the previous session. A first challenge for many of the successful ASEAN economies is to change their economic models. ASEAN, especially East Asia, has followed an export-oriented model, which allows for rapid growth, while OECD countries, especially US and Europe, were happy to run trade deficit after three decades of a successful export-oriented model, the region is slow to adapt to the new situation. But the global financial crisis in 2008 and its aftermath require just that. The current outlook is mixed. To put it simply, global economic growth relies on the U.S. to continue its upturn 
hope for Japan to implement further reform and praise for Europe not to decline further. Trade intensity has declined in part because demand was led by government as part of their counter-cyclical measures. External demand for Asia export is therefore likely to be more lackluster than before the crisis. In addition, normalization of monetary policy will lead to increase in the global interest rate. With more flexible exchange rates, ample reserves, and stronger banking system, most ASEAN countries are now better placed and better prepared than a year ago to handle this. But higher interest rates will provide headwinds for investment demand. ASEAN, therefore, needs to boost its domestic engine growth through productivity. In addition, government can help domestic demand by addressing their infrastructure gap. But the fiscal space for some countries has become limited. India, and to some extent Indonesia, because of the allocation, is one such example. The government will need to select the right investment and govern them smartly to ensure that they will create demand and employment in the short run, but also raise productivity in the long run. As Asia growing middle class will consume more, demand for services such as education, health services, housing, and financial security is set to grow too. Policymakers should build financially sustainable services and by doing so, support domestic demand. But there are also countries who struggle to reform their social sectors, creating a negative effect on the productivity and even threatening the sustainability of their public finance. It will be wise to learn from their mistakes. The second area where ASEAN economies can make a difference in guiding their future is productivity. Despite the rapid growth that developing ASEAN economies experience in recent decades, their productivity still lags behind. China, China's value added per employee is only one seventh of the average OECD. And India is less than one tenth. Productivity will be critical for avoiding the middle income trap. And it is not just about volume, but it is about quality. Mobilizing more capital and more human resources, something that most ASEAN countries have done well, is not guarantee for long-term success. In fact, out of 100 middle-income economies in 1960, only 13 graduated to high-income level. The others got trapped in the middle. Avoiding this trap means, first and foremost, changing the growth model and refocus from mobilizing productive resources to better using them. But this can be challenging. The transition to more productivity-driven growth requires investing in people, upgrading their skills, and gradually building innovation system. It seems that several institutions need to be built concurrently to secure a continued reallocation of resources to, mo to the most productive sectors even after economies reach middle income status. First, countries need to be able to innovate, create and absorb new technologies. Korea achieved this through its university that have strong ties to industry, a well-educated workforce, and a flexible business climate. 
Countries such as China and Malaysia are actively building their own innovation system. Second, they need labor market institutions that maintain flexibility in the labor force. Third, they need financial institutions capable to channel money where it is most productive combined with a positive business climate that allow new firms to emerge and unproductive ones to exit. And finally, they need policies that increase competitiveness and openness to trade that forces companies to innovate and seek further productivity gains. The most difficult part of productivity shift is avoiding state capture. If the privileged few, the elites, protect state enterprises from competition and maintain exclusive access to productive resources, opportunity are wasted. This is where leaders can make a difference by tackling the structure of state-owned companies and by leveling playing field, even if this come at the political cost and the results are not immediate. Mexico is a good example of a country that has tackled necessary but difficult reform, but they have yet to pay off. Further economic integration can be an engine of productivity gain. East Asia close integration has allowed the region to become home to key production network that supply the world. ASEAN has played a central role by keeping external barriers low. We are now only 15 months away from the creation of its economic community, a much anticipated step for further integration. A seamless economic space with 600 million people with growing purchasing power can be a very powerful engine of growth for this region and the world. It could become an important market for global investors. ASEAN can also be an alternative production for China, which is becoming more expensive and will move away from low-skilled manufacturing and export. But for this to become reality, the new economic community must realize its vision. Too many exceptions in opening trade and too many limits on foreign direct investment will undermine its goals. It could undermine ASEAN attractiveness as a location of global supply chain. Pursuing global integration requires political leadership that can explain the benefit and cushion the impact on those that stand to lose in the short, in the short run. It also requires more than signing agreements but hard work in reforming institutions and taking on interest groups that have little interest in sharing the pie. While the European Union has its own struggles, its success is based on the fact that its integration was very broad, even addressing competition and social policies. Its structure, encourage high-level political commitment to implement the union's policies at the country level. We should learn from its success and also mistakes. And to succeed beyond middle income status, countries need to also focus on macroeconomic stability. In some countries in this region, Credit growth has been rapid in recent years, and leverage has been building up. The effect on growth of all this credit have been leveling off, and increasingly credit seems to be propping up asset prices rather than productivity and creating healthy growth. 
reduce pressure from capital inflow in the course of the Fed tapering can help in reducing some of the risks that come along with that. Nevertheless, the balance in some countries should shift from economic stimulus propped by government spending and central bank to containing the built-up financial sector risk. Fiscal consolidation and monetary policies, as well as macroprudential policy, should be used to achieve that balance. The third challenge for ASEAN economies lies in the social fabrics of their countries. Their policy need to be guided by what is good for most, not just a few people. For growing countries in Asia, like countries as well in the past, our ex uh, the fast growing countries in Asia, like any countries as well in the past, are experiencing rapid urbanization, rising income inequality, and a fundamental reorganization of society away from traditional structure. In addition, their societies and labor force are aging. China's labor force has already started to decline, while others, such as India and Indonesia, could still benefit from a demographic dividend in a decade ahead. Without generating sufficient job, these two countries also could face rising tension of growing youth unemployment. Let me focus here on the challenge of rising inequality. With rapid growth in Asia, the gap between the rich and the others has widened, notably in China and Indonesia, but also in India, all three traditionally egalitarian societies. Cross-country analysis of inequality suggests that inequality first rises and then decline again which has been a comforting thought for rapidly growing countries. However, regardless of the debate around his data and methodology, the recent analysis of Piketty suggests otherwise. He finds that the top 10% of earners has considerably increased its share of total income. This is true also for Asia. Some rise in inequality may be good for growth, as it provides the incentive for people to strive to succeed. Some inequality is also a reflection of people moving from traditional to modern sectors. But as World Bank research shows, if inequalities start to affect equity of opportunity, inequality could threaten growth. Further, high inequality could undermine the political consensus needed to implement policy and reform that keep growth high. So countries that strive to reach high income levels should care about three areas to promote a healthy income and wealth distribution. First, Managing inequality requires creating access to equal opportunity. Recent research suggests that many ASEAN countries still perform well in that respect. A child, a child's school performance is less dependent on its parent socioeconomic position than in many other parts of the world. One reason could be that most East Asia countries manage to maintain low-cost public education with reasonable quality. This is something ASEA should protect and even improve. Second, maintaining an open, competitive, and meritocratic society and avoiding political capture by the privileged. To achieve this, 
countries need competitive law, access to finance, and business regulation, and effectively implement them with low barriers to entry. They need inclusive political system that ensure equal access to opportunity in society and can help avoid political capture by the privileged. Third, establishing a tax system that is seen as just could be a further means to manage inequality. This not only requires sufficiently progressive tax law, but also the investment in tax administration to make these laws work. Many countries are struggling to design the right tax policy and set the right rate. As you are all follow, the US and France are just two examples where tax avoidance can dilute the effectiveness of the tax system. This is why the issue needs a collective approach. I've experienced firsthand in fixing tax, tax administrations is very difficult and it is very difficult to overcome this challenge also in many emerging countries. But we should remember that while taxes are important for creating equality, the spending side of the government budget is equally, re equally re relevant and important to address inequality. ASEAN countries have much to be, proud, to be proud of in the way they have managed their economies in the past decades. But they should not take success for granted. The challenging international environment, the need to rebalance growth, and the challenge of productivity and social justice require continued vigilance of policymakers in the years and decades to come. It is encouraging indeed that several countries in the region have revamped their effort to reform in recent years. Japan's Abenomics and China's Third Plenum reform are good example of this. And the incoming governments in other countries, including India and Indonesia, have an opportunity to follow suit. I think it is fair to say that we know a lot about what policy are needed to achieve high income levels, or at least which one to avoid. But maintaining reform momentum won't be easy. And it is no surprise that reform are often accelerate in a crisis when policymakers have no alternative. Making good use of a crisis is one thing. Sustaining the reform over the decades that it takes to bring countries from middle to high income is altogether a different challenge for policymakers. The most crucial ingredient for sustained reform is unlikely to be economics. In my view, it is social justice that maintains consensus for reforms, an open and participatory political system that avoid political capture, and ensure that policies are set to benefit society as a whole rather than the privileged few. Investing in the institution that can deliver on that is probably the best investment policymaker can make. I thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have 20 minutes to run. Uh, how many of you out there, if you could raise your hand, if you'd like to ask any question, or uh, maybe not a hand, a bit of paper would be helpful, because then I can see in the gloom. But think about it, if you haven't, there's a hand going up there, which I'll come to in a moment, uh, one here as well. Um, I've got several questions already here, and we have a shortage of time, needless to say, but let me 
put at least some of the questions here to you, um, particularly what you were talking about inequality. Um, what is the single most, tool, single most important tool the World Bank has at its disposal to contribute to achieve inclusive growth and to attenuate inequality in the world? And I ask that because there's another point being made here that really, in many ways, there's a sense in the region that international financial institutions like the IMF and the World Bank have in this region become irrelevant. Um, is that your perception? Okay. Should I take this to question that, first? Yes, okay. they're both about the role of the World Bank on inequality yeah. and also in this region, the fact that maybe since the uh, GFC you haven't been as active and assertive and as involved as you should have been. Well, Nick, first on the tools, uh, especially you're asking, or this is the question, is about the World Bank role in addressing the inclusive growth or creating more equality. As I said, that it is really depend, or in this case, affected by the equality of the equity of opportunity. So, for the World Bank, of course, we have the resource that is by lending, but also with the knowledge, which is also equally important. So, many countries engage with us. Sometimes, it's not only need the money, but if we are going to lend the money, we just want to make sure that this is going to address the issue of equity of opportunity, whether this is related to the access to the electricity, the road in this case, or school, basic services like school and health. But also in this case, the most important of money is actually on the knowledge. And this is where we as the World Bank actually have the comparative of advantage of operating across the world so that the client country can compare their policy set to actually with other country and not only about what needs to be done and how to do. I mean, I have Ngozi here. He was the managing director of the IMF before. He is now finance minister and coordinating minister. I don't think talking with Ngozi about Nigeria is not about the what. And many f finance ministers have just visited Tanzania and Ethiopia. It's not about what needs to be done. It is about how to do. And institutions like us sometimes can be used to increase the leverage of the reformer without jeopardizing the political momentum and the ownership of the government itself. Because in, the, in this question from Antonio Villegas uh, uh -huh. from Suiba Offshore, Mexico, it's about attenuating inequality in the world. The suggestion there that really, even if you talk about it, you're not as effective as you could and should be. Yeah, well, for the low-income country, maybe the inequality is more about access. For a middle-upper income country, it's really about the distribution. And in this case, it has something to do, for example, with the tax. It's not about that you have to increase your tax rate. It is sometimes it's about the effectiveness of the administration. And to be honest, this is exactly the institutional building which is very challenging, even for the high-income country. So this is the the, what you call it, the right policy with an effective institution is going to be very critical. And what about the, uh, the, the role and perception of yes. the bank in this region? Well, it isn't maybe the perception and the, the, the actually what, what is reality in a way that it is good to see that many countries emerging from low income to become middle income and the need to interact with institutions like World Bank have and should be changed. I mean, we are no longer maybe the most important financial institution to provide capital for the shortage of capital in many low-income countries. Many of them, even if you look at the past five years, is actually entering to the capital market by issuing bonds. And that is actually worrying because sometimes they have to pay with a very high capital interest. But last five years, we are flushed by plenty of liquidity. That's why I can see even Indonesia, but African countries, they start issuing a lot of government bonds. So for us, it is not about the financial power, but it is more about the experience of development and what works and what didn't work in many countries. And that's why the financial aspect in this case is just increasing our ability to have a conversation with the government. Because there's a question here from Omar Lodi of the Abraj Group. Really saying that the reality is the business environment within ASEAN today remains very disparate and protectionist and counterproductive. Well, that's another thing. It's sometimes quite irony in a way that ASEAN, if you compare all across the world, I've been traveling, is being seen as the most actually integrated region. And in terms of the trade flow and investment or even people flow, it's actually quite liberal in a way. 
But I can see that, man, especially after the crisis, 97, and then you have 2008 financial crisis, many countries, especially the bigger they are, they feel that they need to protect their domestic market. I think in terms of what I said in, in the speech, that they need to redesign their economic model by looking domestic. It doesn't mean that you become inward-looking and close economy. It is more that you have to balance your engine of growth. I think the most difficult is mentioned also by previous speakers. It's sometimes it's not about e economic reason. It is about the politic. It's actually avoiding the capture of a certain group who feel that by closing the border is going to protect them from the competition. Right. Uh, can I get the microphone over there and the gentleman here as well? But there's one question here I've got to ask you about the bank. You are chief operating officer. You've been there for four years. Um, for the past two years under Mr. Jim Kim, the World Bank Group seems to be going through chaotic, endless reorganization. The installments of the 14 global practices and weakening of regional heads seem to be re-centralizing power back to DC. When will the bank start to, to again refocus itself to its clients and pressing issues? Well, in any change, it's always easily described as chaotic, but it is because of change. I think we change the way we organize ourselves by I think the reality in which we are operate is that the client not only need the money, but most and most most of them more and more need the knowledge part. But are you worried about the perception reflected in this question? Uh, well, of course, one of the elements of success of change is sometimes have to manage the perception. And, and in this case, we have to be able to explain more and better about what does it mean of changing internally with the, within the bank. I think the most actually critical part of that is actually we are not about ourselves. And this is exactly, I visited Tanzania and Ethiopia. Before that, I was in Nicaragua as well as Haiti. I think when we are discussing and visit a country, the focus about client is really obvious. The change that we are having now design ourselves is just making sure that when our team in the ground in dealing and serving our client, they are going to be fully supported by all resources as well as knowledge that we gain from our operation all over the world. If uh, you don't like the word chaotic, which is the way it's seen from outside, how would no, you describe it? No, I'm not it? saying that I don't like the word chaotic. I'm saying that in a Would you concede there's an issue there, though? That that's the way you're perceived, and it's affecting the credibility of the bank? Well, no, I, I think in this case is that the change will definitely create a perception about that change itself. And I think for people, or in this case, internal as well as external, who see the bank is always in the past 15 years, maybe operating predict in a very predictive, predictable way, it's going to be very shocking to see that it is now changing. So I guess we should focus more on what does it mean of us, the bank, change and reform ourselves. Because as an institution, even if you operate worldwide, I think the need to continue change has become something which is unavoidable. Right. Who's got the question? Who's got the microphone over there? And then here, please. Go Thank ahead. you, Nick. It's Simon Tse from the Singapore Institute of National Affairs. Welcome back to Singapore and ASEAN, Ibani. May I change the topic from the World Bank back to the bit to the world? Um, Ibani, I think you're right. What you've described in terms of what is needed to be done is, is I think, is very much agreed by most uh, right-thinking policymakers and businesses what they need. What, what needs to be done, particularly here in Asia? Uh, if you were advising uh, Modi or a country you know well, Indonesia, what would the priorities be in the first few months of their uh, uh, tenure? The second question is a bit different. And this is a question with a bit of the old business of the bank, the infrastructure question. You know, connecting up, integrating. Uh, how much do you think, uh, besides the, the soft infrastructure, the policies, the people, we still need good old hard infrastructure to integrate our economies? I think that's a hidden question about what would you advise the <laughs> incoming president of Indonesia from October? <laughs> and I, I, I know that you are using these three months, it's like 100 days. I mean, every leader is actually elected for five years, six years, so 100 days is actually is not fair to impose that. But I think... For, for the country, especially you mentioned Indonesia and India in a way, that those leaders elected, they have a mandate because the people really need 
and want to see a change, and especially maybe more ambitious reform so that it can maintain the momentum of growth, creating jobs, and addressing the issue of poverty. I think the two countries still actually have uh, a, a, a number of poverty that need to be addressed. And in this case, the prescription about what needs to be done is not something which is new. It's really about how you effectively implement those reform programs. For example, you mentioned about, in this case, the integration of the ASEAN, which is actually have quite strong in terms of commitment of liberalizing, or in this case, integrating the flow of goods and services. Or even in this case, in the tax as well as the custom, they've already actually starting to have this one single window. I think it's now more about even creating an even playing field and make them really work. So it is not only good at the regulatory level, but really that the business, the people can enjoy it. They can really feel it when they are dealing and they are investing here in this region. On a second question about infrastructure, much has been said about the need. The amount can be one trillion every year. New investment on the infrastructures is needed. And I can see it myself, even when I was finance minister, and I'm sure many of you is also seen, it is not about how much is needed but really like implementing in a much faster with, of course, we have to take care of the social and environmental aspect. And this is maybe the most difficult. Some countries have more land issue, which is going to be more difficult rather than the money itself. I think most of them is not really the money because when you have a good infrastructure uh, project, a lot of money, including especially private sector, is actually willing to actually chip in. But the question sometimes is just, this is, takes so long. There are so many uncertainty of risk, whether related to land or policy. And that's why this is the case in which the government role in actually addressing those issue of risk during those very long construction period is going to be very critical. Could I um, pick up on, on that? And given what George um, said I have to do at the beginning uh, this morning, we need to talk about Indonesia, and that's picking up on Simon's point, but Kishore Mabubani raises the, the critical questions for your home country about the three big reforms uh, that the new president should do immediately. Quote, cut fuel subsidies, which are worth 21 billion at the moment, the fuel subsidy bill. Um, have an open skies policy, implement fully ASEAN economic community commitments. Um, what's, what's your view? Well, I think many has been done by the, what they call it, transition team. And what I hear from Indonesia is that the commitment of the new leadership on addressing this fuel subsidy is very strong. So it will be seen whether by October that is going to be true, because many is already m mentioning that they are going to address. And I, I know that Yusuf Kala, the vice president, and I met Pat Jokowi at some point. I think they knew that if they are going to create more meaningful progress, especially on the infrastructure, address, uh, addressing the issue of even poverty, much resource which is now spent for the fuel subsidy need to be reallocated to this most productive. And this is not only the, the experience of Indonesia. Indonesia has it, they have their own experience back in 2000, 2006 when they actually also increasing the fuel price. But many countries in the world is actually has been experiencing of changing the fuel subsidy. You can see here Ngozi is actually doing also very, very brave in Nigeria because this is not about what needs to be done. It's actually the political pressure is going to be very, very, very actually hard for many politicians to really implement that. Were you issuing a, a sort of yellow card to your own country when you talked several times in your speech about an open merit, merit, meritocratic society, not pat, patronage for the privilege, um, uh, that there must not be political capture by the privilege? You said it several times um, in your remarks. Well, Nick, I've been traveling all over the world, and to be honest, visiting many countries. I, even now, I live in Washington, and I read a lot of news and met with many of the policy makers. I think the issue about uh, elite capture is not only a single, unique problem of a country. Even in this case, because I come from Indonesia, it's referring to the Indonesia. You can easily see when I met with prime minister or talk with some of the private sector, with the minister of finance, 
explicitly or implicitly, they always the most difficult struggle for them is actually try to avoid this elite capture when they try to push a reform. That's happened everywhere. So in this case, I'm not saying that, as I said, especially now, when the time that all policymakers, including people and private sector, can access news. So the question about what needs to be done is not something which is so difficult But to you're find. saying that this is holding up growth. Many countries are facing exactly the same, like that kind of challenge. Right. Please. Microphone here, please. Budi Sadikin from Bank Mandiri. First, Ibu, uh, congratulations as the first woman panelist in the summit. <laughs> the question is, as the fourth most populous country in the world and the 16th largest economy on the world, what is the most important thing the new Indonesian president should do to help propelling Indonesia, Asia, and global economic growth? Could I just add something there, because it builds on this. This is from Li Hao Kian from Kuala Lumpur, Kipong, um, because he is saying that Indonesia recently turned more nationalistic towards foreign investments, proposing to severely limit foreign shareholdings at a time when Indonesia has huge need for capital, in other words, attention there. Um, how much uh, is this political posturing versus an inherent underlying trend? So you've got two points there on Indonesia. Well, I think there are, it's interesting if you look at the statistic in this case, the, even if you look at the last two quarter, the capital flow in Indonesia is huge. It's not because of the, there is plenty of liquidity, but also you can see it on the equity. The question is more on the quality of the capital flow, how you are going to move it from the short term, and sometimes that will be very disruptive if they are coming and out, to a more FDI. And here, I can see that because Indonesia in the past has been busy with the election, and in many other countries, even the most advanced one, when you are close to the election, the nationalistic rhetoric is usually very popular. I, I think this is something that you really need to, to know more on that. But once you are there, you become the policy maker. They know exactly the trade-off of the policy choices. And I see many or many in this case, even on the debate of the president, that even in this case, the two candidates are quite, in this case, committed to make the growth, and they know that by having a commitment to the high growth that create job and ad addressing poverty, I think they really need the capital. Indonesia have a quite decent saving rate, so domestic saving is actually there. But it's more deepening of the financial system that will require, that may, make that to actually becoming meaningful as an investment source. But still with that, they still need foreign capital. And in this case, I think reconciling about the political rhetoric with the reality about what needs to be done as a country. Also, Nick, maybe I, I need to mention this. Uh, I, I, I repeatedly mentioned Nigeria because I sit next to... We're about to, to go and, uh, and Kozi would like, has got the microphone. Would like to speak in this case. But this is like, when you are in ASEAN, Indonesia is the biggest in terms of population, in, in terms of the size. And I think being the biggest member of the ASEAN 10, the more the Indonesia able to create a strong foundation, it will not only good for Indonesia, but will create a more stability and prosperity for the ASEAN or even Asia. But let me give you a point here about perception. There's another question here about nationalist rhetoric in Indonesia, as it's put, i.e. ownership um, caps in plantations and banks running counter to the desire for ASEAN integration. Much of this rhetoric is driven by parliament can the new government lead Indonesia away from this direction? Should it? Well, as I, I think being said by Vishnu Wardana previously, I think you have an executive branch, you have the, the legislative branch. I mean, the legislative on behalf of people or whatever that they are representing, they always can talk about whatever. And that is exactly the art of the democracy. I mean, you believe in democracy, everybody believe in democracy, I think. And in this case, I think you really have to manage this power sharing and how you can effectively govern what I said, what is best for the society as a whole rather than few privilege. Sometimes democracy frustrates you, right, Nick, in this case. Um, so, 
but we don't want this to actually become the reason not to do the right thing for right. the country. Okay, let me go to Nkozi, and also someone at the back had the microphone. I apologize, I didn't know you had the microphone. We've literally got about three minutes left. Nkozi, if you could uh, give a short intervention, please. <coughs> thank you, Nick. Is this on? It is, yeah, we're gonna yeah, rush the microphone. Thank you, very now. fast. I think we want to move away to a broader topic. Uh, that of the role of the, of the, the World Bank Group in ASEAN, uh, and generally beyond ASEAN, do you think, as a comment, that given the fact that you know uh, um, channeling capital may not be the strongest role anymore, but using the risk instruments that the World Bank has to try to catalyze more capital into those areas that need it for this huge investment in infrastructure, not only in ASEAN, but elsewhere, can the bank group play more of a role in that? Is that might that be one of the ways it could be useful in ASEAN? And, and, um, and uh, uh, secondly, um, mitigating risk mitigation in general, help and helping got governments to reduce the bureaucratic burdens okay. that are in front of businesses within the region. It takes seven years to make an investment. Can the World Bank do, group do anything about that? Because there's a, an additional question about whether what your view is of the proposal by China for the establishment of an Asian infrastructure bank. Our time is short uh, with our special guest at lunchtime, but if you could be brief. Well, on the risk, uh, well, Ngozi was MD before, so it's good to see he's, he's back in the country. I think it's really like on an instrument of how a, an institution like the bank who has the triple A as well as have the IFC and MIGA as a group that we can use all the alternative of instrument to our client that they need all those kind of interaction. And this is exactly what we try to do at this moment, that we work more as a group so that the client will see us with the choices of instrument and policy. And I think that's fit very well, so I agree with that. On mitigating the risk, especially on the bureaucracy burden, well, that is exactly, a, a, first the banks should also becoming less bureaucratic. I think that's what I hear more and more from many of the clients. And that is going to be something that we really need to be able to actually bridging, the, especially on the need of the very long process, especially in a project, which sometimes then create a lot of risks from the exchange rate, maturity, or policy change. So we try to actually design an instrument to be able to do that. That's including the establishment of global infrastructure fund. And you mentioned about the ASEAN infrastructure fund by the China. I think if you look at the need of one trillion investment in infrastructure every year, Nick, even if the World Bank can be increased the capital by twice, it's, it, 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 it will never actually adequate. So we really welcome this kind of initiative, and I think it will be good for us to really partnering, because I'm sure the experience of the Bretton Woods, like World Bank, for more than 60 years, it's going to be valuable in actually providing what needs to be done, what should be avoided in order to you to be able to use this precious capital to really build infrastructure for the better of the Because society. there's a comment here from Andrew Getchy of uh, ANZ, Bank ANZ, I think it is, um, about the impact of Basel III and Solvency II on the availability of capital and disincentivizing the financing of infrastructure and that limiting, therefore, the amount of cash available. Yeah, well, that has been being discussed because I think just the normal cycle after a huge crisis back in 2008, there is always a tendency for the regulation to go through the very conservative in order to avoid the same risk or crisis. And that means for many of the financial institutions, they have to face with this more like a conservative direction of regulation that uh, make them maybe more constrained with their ability to use their capital to create the leverage. Thank you. All right. Uh, I pinched the microphone from you. I'm over time. Is there one quick point you want to make? You, you've got the microphone there, I think, have you? Quickly, and then we have to adjourn. Can you make Thank a quick you. point? So my point was... Go ahead, go ahead. My point was just that uh, since uh, Her Excellency, the Nigerian uh, Finance Minister is here, she could also uh, explain how her country is also uh, tackling the oil subsidy issue, which is, I think, very similar to one that Indonesia is facing. All right, thank you. Um, that's on the agenda, but uh, I can't go down that track uh, at the moment. Thank you very much. Well, Nick, you can advise George. Next year, you should have more women panelists here. So maybe I can appear with Ngozi. George, George do you want to say anything on that point at the moment? <laughs> 
full agreement. I'm, and I have to ask, because a number of people have asked me to ask you, uh, are you expecting to rebase from Washington to Jakarta at any time soon? I think you, you said that we've already running out of time. Yeah, we're out of okay. time. I think it's better to have a prime minister. Thank you very much. <laughs>